Hello, today we'll be talking about Somalia and the Somali Civil War and how Somalia fell into a civil war. It's in the title. And let's go back to the 19 whenever the script starts. Now yes, I do understand that Somalia has a long history of fighting off colonial powers and also fighting Ethiopia. But for the sake of this video, I'm going to be skipping that and just going to about the end of World War II. Did I say end of World War II? I meant during World War II, where Britain would take over Italian Somalia. And then right after World War II, they'd hand it right back but only under the condition that Somalia would gain independence in about 10 years. And for those that don't know what happened after World War II, and know it's not the Cold War, decolonization would begin across the world. And when decolonization made its way to the Horn of Africa, many Somali inhabited areas were incorporated into Somalia, like British Somalia, but a lot of Somali areas were not incorporated into Somalia. In northern Kenya, Somali inhabited areas were given to the Kenyan government, while the Somali inhabited Ogaden region would fall under the control of Ethiopia. And following a very highly controversial referendum in French Somalia, they would vote to not join Somalia. Somalia, with or without these states, would gain independence in 1960, and President Aden Abdullah Osmandar would be elected as the first president of the Somali Republic. He was followed by President Abdul Rashid Ali Shamark, who became president in 1967. But in 1969, President Shamark would be assassinated by one of his bodyguards, and a military coup would be kicked off, led by Major General Mohamed Siad Barre. Like I just stated a sentence before, Mohamed Siad Barre would come into power after leading a military coup in 1969. Siad Barre would then establish the Somali Democratic Republic, where communist and socialist ideas were adopted and the country would begin to gain Soviet support. Siad Barre early rule would see the Somali state nationalize and modernize many Somali industries, along with the rise of literacy within the country. Siad Barre would also begin to promote the ideas of pan-Somaliism, where a Somali person should overlook their clan loyalty and view each other as Somali above all. He also pushed for the idea of a greater Somalia, which is the ideal state in which all Somali inhabited areas would be united. Siad Bari's rule, excluding the whole one-party state system, coming to power via a military coup, the silencing of political opposition, which is a lot of stuff, was pretty stable up until the ousting of King Hali Salahi in Ethiopia and the formation of the Derg government after a military coup led by Marxist-Leninist. The new Derg government would find itself plagued with infighting and the purging of political opposition. This surprisingly led to political instability in Ethiopia and later on would kick off the Ethiopian Civil War. Now one group to kick off at the very start of the Ethiopian Civil War was the Western Somali Liberation Front, which would actually be based in Eastern Ethiopia unless if they prescribe to the Greater Somalia idea in which they're Western Somalia. But I find that kind of funny. It's like the World War II thing where people say the Soviets were fighting on the Eastern Front, but for the Soviets, they're pushing westward. You know what? This is a good question. What do Soviets call that? Do they call it the Western Front or the Eastern Front? Yo, somebody should look that up. Now, seeing how the Derg and the Somali Democratic Republic both have communist and socialist leanings, you'd think they'd get along. They didn't. Remember, Siad Barre wanted to unite Somali areas, and Ethiopia happened to control a pretty big Somali area, the Somali-inhabited Ogaden region. Siad Barre would invade the Ogaden region with Western Somali Liberation Front support in the hopes of annexing the region and uniting Somali-populated areas. The Ogaden War would kick off with a Somali invasion on July 15, 1977. Somali forces and the Western Somali Liberation Forces would make massive gains into the Ogaden region during the initial stage of the war until the Soviet Union halted their aid to Somalia and just began to send it to Ethiopia along with Cuban troops that began to fight in the Ogaden region. And just like any good old classic Cold War proxy conflict, the US would then begin to support Somalia. And I mean twist, because Somalia was just getting Soviet arms but now America was like hell yeah kill some of them godless communists. No 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 no. No 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 no. No 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 no. No, 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 no. Even though Somalia was just singing tunes to the Soviet Union, but that's not important now, right? 
but US support for Somalia just wasn't enough compared to the Soviet arms and the Cuban troops, and by 1978, the Somali army was pushed out of the Ogaden region, effectively ending the war with an Ethiopian victory. Following the Somali defeat at the Ogaden War, Syed Bari would punish and kill some military officers, and let's just say that made people very tense. The failure of the Ogaden War would be the first nail into Syed Bari's government's coffin, it would be the snowball effect that would plunge Somalia into a state of civil war. In the year 1979, a military coup was kicked off against Syed Bari. Syed Bari was able to quell this coup and quickly began to lead collective punishments against the clans these coup leaders were from. Syed Bari would take aim at the Majatarin clan. As stated in the book Somalia A Case Study, the Red Berets systematically smashed the small reservoirs in the area around Gasako to deny water to the Omar Muhammadun Majatarin sublineages and their herds in May and June 1979. This is just one example of what Syed Bari did to the Majatarin clan. After that, any form or sign of political opposition to Syed Bari and his government were not just crushed along political lines, but also along clan lines. This didn't stop political opposition. We can't forget he came to power through a coup. He had a one-party state, he switched sides during the Cold War, and now he's targeting clans as a form of silencing political opposition. And in 1979, the Somali Salvation Democratic Front would be formed to counter Syed Bari's government. The group was formed by one of the coup leaders, and they weren't the only group to oppose Syed Bari's government. In 1981, the Azak-led Somali National Movement was also formed to counter Syed Bari and his government. These anti-Syed Bari groups would gain Ethiopian support and would begin to lead or intensify their insurgencies in Somalia. And in 1982, you would see an Ethiopian-backed Somali Salvation Democratic Front invasion into central Somalia with the goals of ousting Syed Bari. The Somali Salvation Democratic Front and Ethiopian forces managed to capture these Somali border towns. But even with the capture of these border towns, the Somali government was able to halt the Ethiopian Somali Salvation Democratic Front invasion after getting US support, but not without losing land to Ethiopia until 1988. Within the same year, the Somali national movement would begin to intensify its insurgent actions in northern Somalia. This would cause Syed Bari to unleash the full power of the army on everyone within the northern region. Civilian rebel, Izak or not, if you were in the northwest region, region, you became a military target. And in this case, the Azat clan was the main targeted group. This happened because the Somali national movement tended to have a Azat majority within the group. The Azat genocide was a systematic state-sponsored series of attacks against Azat clans, mostly between 1987 to 1989, under the rule of Syed Bari. The number of dead from this genocide ranges from 50,000 to 100,000. So you could take your pick on how genocidal you think Syed Bari was. During the Azak genocide, you would see extrajudicial killings, the bombing and military storming of major cities in the north. Some that did fall under the control of the Somali national movement, but some just had a lot of Azak people with no rebels in them. You would also see the systematic destruction of Azak dwellings, settlements, and water points, along with mass arrests and the displacement of Azak civilians. The Azak genocide also didn't destroy the Somali national movement. The Somali national movement would actually gain more support and would begin to lead more guerrilla operations against Syed Bari's regime. By the start of the 1990s, Somalia had become a nation riddled with insurgencies, collective clan punishment, genocide, political strife, and an only increasing oppressive regime. After the Azak genocide, you would see the formation of the Somali Patriotic Movement, which were formed by Ogaden Somalis after they became disillusioned with the Syed Bari government. You would also see the formation of the United Somali Congress, which was formed after Syed Bari led a crackdown against the Hawaii clan. Hey, is this dude ever gonna learn that doing clan crackdowns and collective punishments isn't helping him? Following the death of Bishop Monsegur Colombo, murdered by an unknown gunman, religious leaders would also begin to oppose Syed Bari's government. With the Somali National Movement insurgency in the Northwest, the United Somali Congress in the Center West, I think that's what you'd call it, and the Somali Patriotic Movement being in the South and Southwest of Somalia, gun battles breaking out in Mogadishu, and simple football matches becoming areas of protests and riots against Syed Bare, Syed Bare would flee Mogadishu to Gido, where he would try to retake the city of Mogadishu twice, but fell twice to rebel leader Mohamed Farah Abdi. Syed Bare would first flee to Kenya before going into exile in Nigeria, where he later died of a heart attack. By 1991, the Somali Democratic Republic was pretty Pretty dead, and with no clear government and rebel unity being pretty questionable, as stated in the book Historical Dictionary of Somalia, New Edition, 
The overthrow of Syed Bari's regime in 1991 was prelude to total disintegration. The opposition groups were all clan-based factions fighting for their own particular interests. Some of them focused their activity on areas historically controlled by their respective clans. That being said, throughout the Somali rebellion, many rebel groups did try to incorporate other clans into their groups, but I think it just didn't work out. The United Somali Congress would nominate Ali Mahdi Mohammed as interim president of Somalia. But like I stated, rebel unity was pretty wonky, and Mohamed Farah Abdi, who worked for the United Somali Congress, and other Somali groups would not accept this, and gun battles began all across Somalia and Mogadishu, as everybody was not trying to fill that power vacuum, and boy was it sucking. The anti bare rebel alliance began to disintegrate as rebel groups began to fight among each other all across Somalia. In northern Somalia, the Somali national movement just broke away from Somalia and would form Somaliland. By 1992, Somalia was in a state of civil war, anarchy, and famine, along with many more groups and splinter groups. Too much for me to know our list. You would also see Syed Bari loyalists lead a few death blows into Mogadishu trying to reclaim the city. The international community didn't want to just sit back and watch a country fall into anarchy, civil war, and famine. And would at first begin to send food aid to Somalia and later on international troops to maintain order in 1992. Thank God after this, civil wars, especially in Africa, especially during the 90s, were never overlooked by the international community. I should probably get into detail about that whole UN operation. But by early 1993, growing tension between the UN observers and militias were beginning to boil and come to a head. With the establishment of the Unified Task Force, aka UNITA, wait I think it's called UNITAF, but I'll be calling them peacekeepers due to the sheer amount of acronyms I have in this script, would move into Mogadishu and other parts of Somalia with the same goals of easing the famine and halting violence in Somalia. They would begin to work on enforcing safe zones in Mogadishu, and by 1993, the United Nations operation in Somalia entered its second phase. The phase was a lot more confronting compared to the first one. Like I said before, already building up tension between warlords, especially Mohammed Farah Abdi and the peacekeepers were pretty high, and at times there were shootout and bombings between both sides, resulting in death for both sides. In July 1993, Italian troops would actually fight against Somali militiamen at the Battle of Checkpoint Pasta. I didn't have to add that into the video, it's just a funny battle name. In September 1993, a Black Hawk would also be shot down over Mogadishu by Mohamed Farah of the militiamen. Now I feel like I really need to drive home the fact that there is rising tensions between the warlords and the peacekeepers. The tension was so high that the UN would actually pass a council resolution called this in June 1993, after 24 Pakistani peacekeepers were killed by Mohammed Farah of the militiamen. In very simple terms, the resolution allowed the peacekeepers to hunt down Mohammed Farah of the and a warrant was put over his head. While in July 1993, Somali elders, clan leaders, and militia leaders would all meet up to work on easing tensions between the peacekeepers and Mohammed Farah of these militia. They all agreed to meet up in one building in Mogadishu. It is rumored that Mohammed Farah Abdi was going to come and attend these talks. Now, whether or not this rumor is true, the US would find out about this meeting and would actually send a delegation with Somali translators to help ease tensions is what I would like to say, but no. US forces perceived the meeting as a meeting of Somali militiamen and militia leaders plotting attacks against UN forces. And I mean that's a pretty big hiccup because Somali newspapers publicly were stating the intentions of this talk. The US would then conduct the operation on this building called Operation Michigan. Now to oversimplify the operation, the operation would see the bombing of this building with Cobra attack helicopters in the hope of killing Mohammed Farah Abdi and any anti-UN militia leaders. This operation would lead to the death of many of the Somali elders, clan leaders, and militia leaders within that building as the US believed that they were targeting a meeting of violent Somali militiamen who were planning to kill more UN troops. While on the ground, Somalis felt that the US conducted a violent attack on a council of elders and clan leaders who were ironically enough trying to ease tensions between Mohammed Farah Abdi and the peacekeepers. Following the bombing, four journalists would actually make their way to the scene where they arrived to an angry Somali crowd. Those four journalists were then attacked and killed by an angry and vengeful mob when they arrived on the scene. Some people actually see this event as a radicalizing moment for many Somali militias and it would help stoke anti-American sentiment. And the death toll of this attack is disputed, it ranges from 24 to 73 dead Somalis, with even the innocence of the dead being disputed. And at the end of the operation, Mohammed Farah Abdi wasn't even at the building. 
The second phase of the United Nations operation in Somalia is currently known for Operation Gothic Serpent. And no, it's not a phase, mom! The operation was supposed to only take 30 minutes. The goal was to capture Mohamed Farah of the foreign minister and his top political advisor. And everything seemed fine. And then the operation would take a wrong turn when two American Blackhawks were shot out of the sky by Mohamed Farah of the militiamen and the Battle of Mogadishu would commence, lasting the whole day and then some. I think this might be the time I should tell you Operation Gothic Serpent is also known as Black Hawk Down. By the end of the battle, 19 American peacekeepers, one Malay peacekeeper, and one Pakistani peacekeeper, along with hundreds of Somalis, were killed. Following the Battle of Mogadishu, the US would announce its withdrawal from Somalia, and in 1994, they withdrew, followed by the UN, leaving Somalia to its own devices. Now in 1995, or 1992, or 1993, but definitely by 1995, the Islamic Court Unions were formed. The Islamic Court Union was a union consisting of Islamists and Islamic legal scholars that would begin to work on establishing themselves as a group known for maintaining law and order through strict Sharia law. They started off as a light union among Islamic courts across southern Somalia in Mogadishu where they were able to gain local support. Whatever unions people were going to, Somalia was still in a state of civil war and by 1996, Muhammad Farah Abdi would be killed while in Rita Mogadishu while partaking in street clashes. His son who was an ex-marine and served in operation Operation Desert Storm, Hussein Mohammed Farah Abdi would then be picked as the leader of the Somali National Alliance. Which I mean is an interesting turn of events and jobs if you ask me. I mean how do you even explain that? And to be honest at this point the Somali National Alliance had so many inner party splits and conflicts, I'm kind of not gonna add that into the video. You would also see the formation of a new rebel group, the Wahraini Resistance Army, which was formed in southern Somalia to counter Hussein Abdi. As the 1990s became older, peace talks would begin among the many Somali groups and warlords. In 1997, you had the 1997 National Salvation Conference, which was boycotted by Hussein Abdi and Somaliland. And in 1997, you had the 1997 Cairo Peace Conference aka the Cairo Declaration, which was attended by every major faction. And in 1998, you had the 1998 Badal Conference. That conference didn't go well as there was gun battles all across Mogadishu and Somalia and the country was suffering from a cholera outbreak. But by the year 2000, the transitional national government would be established as the international recognized government of Somalia. The transitional national government would last from 2000 to 2004 as they were followed by the transitional federal government formed in 2004. But even with an internationally recognized government, this doesn't mean Somalia was stable. The transitional federal government did have inter-party splits and warlords still controlled portions of Somalia and in the capital Mogadishu. Now while everybody's busy with the many warlords and who's the legal government of Somalia, in 2006 the Islamic Court Union and warlords in Mogadishu would begin to have very intense staring competitions between each other. This would cause the more secular warlords to form the Alliance for the Restoration of Peace and Counterterrorism, also known as acronyms I'm not gonna say. I think you guys know why. I'll be calling these guys secular forces. And with growing tension between the Islamic courts and secular forces, the street clashes in Mogadishu between these guys would end up kicking off the second Battle of Mogadishu, lasting from May 7th to June 11th and ending with the Islamic Court victory. The Islamic Court victories weren't only in Mogadishu and the Islamic Courts began to spread all across southern Somalia, angering a lot of warlords and Ethiopia in the process. Ethiopia at first would only conduct cross-border operations and raids to counter Islamic Court expansion and influence and well before you knew it, uh, Ethiopia was kind of invading Somalia with Somali support to oust the Islamic courts and in December 2006, after a string of military victories, the Islamic courts would leave the city of Mogadishu. But this doesn't mean the war was over. Many Islamic court fighters and leaders would flee to the Juba River Valley where the Islamic court union would do its last conventional war stand at the Battle of Jalibi. Following the Battle of Jalibi, the Islamic courts would then wage a guerrilla war against Somali and Ethiopian troops and they would actually gain land. Now I gotta say something, the Islamic courts kinda became two things. One was the formation of a new political party called the Alliance for the Reliberation of Somalia. Former Islamic Court Union leaders did join this party and would partake in the Djibouti Peace Agreement. The agreement called for a nationwide ceasefire, the allowance of UN international troops, and the Ethiopian pullout. 
This was accepted by the transitional government and the Alliance for the Reliberation of Somalia political party. But Inner Alliance for the Reliberation of Somalia political party would see a split between the moderates and the hardliners. The moderates had no problem accepting this peace treaty, or the hardliners didn't want to accept any peace treaty. The hardliners would then continue, or for some, begin their insurgency against Ethiopian and Somali troops. This is where you see the formation and the strengthening of groups like Al-Shabaab and Hezbollah Islam. And well, this is where the current Somali civil war is today. You have Islamist insurgent groups in the south, you have Somaliland fighters in the north, and the Somali government is trying its best to maintain order with the support of foreign troops. The Somali civil war would also see blood be spilled to neighboring countries, whether it be troops or civilians. Hmm. Who would have known that a failed war, clan collective punishments, and a coup led by Syed Bari would plunge Somalia into a state of civil war for 42 years and counting? Damn, this is a depressing ending. But most of my videos are depressing endings.